Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here this evening and thank you to Sherry and the whole team at the Red Cross for inviting us. I am uh, Rachel Friedman, I'm a family physician and, uh, and physician educator here at Kaiser Permanente in Santa Rosa. And wildfires are really close to home because as in Santa Rosa, as you know, we had the Tubbs fire in 2017 uh, that um, devastated our community. It was also at a particularly unique time because it was right as we were recruiting new family physicians to join our community to train. And so we had to kind of learn really quickly how to find the silver linings in disaster. And what we realized is that we had this unique opportunity to actually become leaders in training physicians and being uh, community health advocates to think about how we can help protect our community members' health and how we can help teach everyone um, about the health effects of smoke and about how to kind of stay on the leading edge of the wildfires that we know are gonna continue to be a part of our lives. So I'm here tonight with Shannon McDermott, who is our research project manager and a PhD and part of our residency program and has helped do a lot of research around this topic. And Dr. Trish Heiser wrote, also a family physician and the director of our program. We call our project the Inhales Project, which is improving negative health effects after lengthy exposure to smoke. So as you all probably know, fire and smoke are kind of our new normal. And when we look at the top 10 wildfires in California's measured history, eight out of 10 of them have occurred since 2017. We know that the ongoing climate crisis means that this is probably gonna be more of the same. And we know that part of disaster planning and recovery means preventing, or actually, if you didn't know, then what we are hoping to tell you is that part of disaster planning and recovery is really preventing and reducing the effects of smoke exposure. Because fortunately, actual deaths, thank you, welcome Dr. Heiser, I just wanted to welcome you. Um, actual deaths caused directly by many of these fire wildfires have been thankfully low. Um, and so when you look at uh, the you know, number of deaths on these, these um, tables, thanks to early detection, warning systems, early evacuation protocols, um, it's, it's great that we're not losing lives directly due to the wildfires. However, what isn't measured by this graph right here is the, not the mortality, which is the, what we call in medicine, like can the number of deaths due to something, but morbidity, which is the disease and the other side effects due to something. And the morbidity, the consequences of Oh, the, you're not seeing the, the slides. Slide the yeah, screen? the slides aren't progressing, so I was just going to jump in. Uh, hmm, Maybe okay. unshare and then share again. Sure. I can barely hear it. Can you guys hear that? Do you have it on your computer? Sound is good. Sound is great. Okay, I'm just going to. So. Often there's an icon that looks like the megaphone with uh, three different lines by it in the lower right hand corner of your screen. If you click that often, you can move the cursor up to increase your volume. Is that screen better? Are you seeing my slides now? I can now? see top 20 largest California wildfires. And we can okay. hear you. Okay. Okay. So. Um, as I was saying, and tell me if you're now seeing this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what's not listed on this chart, thank you, um, Trish, for telling me, is the number of people directly affected by wildfire smoke. And so probably it's in the millions. And so what we, you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that many of you are Red Cross volunteers. You, you are dedicating your time, your energy, your efforts to helping communities um, heal, recover, and, um, and, and be protected from wildfires. And so we hope in this presentation to really help you learn new things to help protect you. Now, we hope you're gonna learn some new things. So we wanted to do an informal pretest. Uh, you won't be graded and um, you don't have to put your answers in the chat. This is just for you. But what we are gonna re um, review in this presentation and uh, is what is PM 2.5 and why should I care? Why should you care? And where does it come from? Number two, what are some symptoms of wildfire smoke and smoke exposure that don't involve difficulty breathing or the lungs? And who is at risk for that? 
Number three, what is AQI? And how should how can you look at it? How do you get to it? When should you look at it? What should you do about it? Number four, which masks work best to filter smoky air? Number five, what can you do if you can't afford expensive HEPA filters in every single room? And if you don't know what a HEPA filter is, we're going to go over that too. And then finally, how can we all think about and work together to keep our communities healthy and protected from wildfire smoke? So again, the topics overview, we're going to talk about wildfire smoke, we're going to talk about the health dangers, we're going to understand AQI, and then we're going to think about protecting yourself and others during smoke events. So part one, what is so bad about wildfire smoke? I mean, the, the biggest thing is that fires are big, right? We're seeing these huge fires. They're creating their own tornadoes, the like fire nados. The smoke is that's generated is massive, and that smoke travels, uh, I think, to the East Coast in some of the last year's wildfires. I mean, it just travels so far. And what travels farthest are the teeniest, tiniest particles. These particles are created by the ash and the, uh, you know, the after effects of the fire. And the, the challenge with wildfires in particular, when they're not planned, not planned burns and other controlled burning of uh, wood and fossil and fuels, is that, you know, we know that structures go up in smoke and, uh, you know, metal and plastics and, other materials that are not supposed to be breathed in. I mean, wood fire smoke is not supposed to be breathed in either, but these are dangerous chemicals, and these chemicals create these volatile, tiny, tiny particles called PM 2.5. And in this picture is a human hair. That big ropey thing is actually supposed to, to uh, simulate a human hair. So think about one of your hairs, how small it is. PM 2.5 particles, part of particulate matter, PM, is 2.5 microns, which is 1 20th the width of a human hair. Super, super tiny. And so then what happens? These super, super tiny particles then get breathed in and they're so small that they evade all of our protective things. We have nose hairs to help trap, trap stuff when we breathe in and we have other little hairs that we like when you sneeze and you cough up. That helps to protect you from breathing in bigger things. And then you have your lungs have all these, you know, protective filters and mechanisms so that stuff doesn't get into your bloodstream. These PM 2.5 particles are so tiny that they they evade all those protective layers of filtration that your body has. And so they go directly into your bloodstream where then they can wreak havoc and create inflammation in your body. So what we know is even if the respiratory uh, system itself isn't negatively affected, the inflammation like Dr. Friedman is mentioning will be a, an incredible burden on the body. And so we see chronic medical conditions begin to flare and patients decompensate, even though they may be breathing okay. Now, before we go into too much detail about these effects, we want to ask you, so this is your first chance to try to use this poll, and we're going to see if it works because we haven't used it before in this type of presentation either. So Shannon, do you want to lead us through? Absolutely. So I put, like I said to the people who are on previously, I've put some instructions in the chat. So we're going to try right now to text your response into this question or you go through your web browser. Um, and again, the, the instructions are above um, in the chat. From your perspective, what are some symptoms of wildfire smoke exposure? So if any of you have been, um, you know, breathed in wildfire smoke, what symptoms did you experience? Or what do you think is a common symptom um, that's a health related symptom from wildfire smoke exposure? So you can either put it in the Teams chat if, if this is all too much, or you can try Poll Everywhere um, by texting your response uh, to 22333. Is that working, Rachel? It's not. Okay, and see if that works. I think I might need to be sharing my screen, Rachel. Okay, do you want me to share? Do you want me to go off and you share? We're giving it a try, everyone. Thanks for bearing with us. It's always good to try new technology. So there we There's are. There's some great. Great symptoms, not great. You don't want them, but great answers. How about that in the chat? Great. 
Hello, test text. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Great. So in Excellent. the chat, we're seeing cough, hard to breathe, not being able to clear lungs, pain, fatigue, headaches, difficulty sleeping, coughing, Shorten eyes burning. Mm -hmm. Fatigue, yep, tired. Schmutz coming out of your nose and eyes. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Schmutz is a great word. We use it. The technical good term. One. I love it. <laughs> That's right. Raspy voice is another one for sure. Sneezing, uh -huh. voice changes. Yep. Mm -hmm. SOB is shortness of breath, the medical abbreviation. There's <laughs> another thing it can stand for, but we're not going to say that here. You mean son <laughs> of a bitch. <laughs> And um, and just to clarify, PM and PM 2.5 isn't parts particulate parts per million. Um, it actually, I believe, refers to per fine particulate matter. Uh, because the 2.5 is not 2.5 parts per million. It's actually the size in microns of the particulate matter. Okay, so lots of great ideas here, Rachel. Um, great. Let's move on. Great. So it sounds like, let me just make sure that you that this is working. I can see it. Okay, so, so some immediate effects of wildfire smoke, as everyone just mentioned, are uh, itchy eyes. All, it, basically everything from the irritation of all of that particulate matter. So we're talking about everything from itchy eyes, it's because you don't wear masks on your eyes unless you're wearing, you know, really tight fitting goggles. Um, itchy, you know, irritated nose, runny nose, nasal congestion, headaches. Uh, I, I've often told people I have a barometer for for uh, smoke in the air because I just get directly a headache when the AQI goes above 100. Um, uh, sinus pressure, scratchy throat. And um, I think somebody, I, it blipped really quickly, but I think someone said is, are these different from other types of smoke or, or particulate matter? And no. I, so the immediate effects of wildfire smoke is, same, is the same as if you're in smog, if you're somewhere where there's a lot of dust. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of reasons that there's air pollution and wildfire smoke is just one of them. It happens to be one of our most prevalent in this area. But um, but no, it's, you know, any particulate matter that shouldn't be in your on your mucous membranes, like your eyes and your nose and your mouth and your throat and your lungs, will cause that irritation. It's your body telling you, please get out of this, right? It's not, this is not supposed to happen and it will create mucus and it will create sneezing. It, it's trying its best to expel. The challenge with wildfire smoke is that it's not limited. If you if you have a lot of dust and you breathe in some dust and you get out of it, or there's pollen and you breathe in the pollen and you sneeze and then you get out of it, there's not necessarily any long-term effect. With wildfire smoke, the problem is that those 2.5, those PM 2.5 particles, they don't just affect your eyes and your nose and your lungs. They get inside your bloodstream and then they can cause major exacerbations of both respiratory illness like asthma, COPD, pneumonia, acute bronchitis. They can cause people who didn't have previous asthma uh, diagnoses to suddenly have asthma-like conditions. We're seeing a lot of that in our primary care clinics. People who are you know, fully grown adults, never had any problem with asthma, are not in an age when we usually newly uh, diagnose asthma, having asthma-like symptoms after a common cold or asthma-like symptoms with the smoke exposure. And then cardiovascular outcomes are, I think, um, a lot less known about because we don't necessarily think about cardiovascular health when we're thinking about smoke and, and, and lung-related things. But so that smoke exposure can increase blood pressure. It can cause arrhythmias, sometimes fatal arrhythmias, which are irregular heartbeats. It can cause, uh, you know, increased risk of strokes and premature death, as well as anything related to inflammatory. So someone mentioned kind of body pain. We know that diabetes is an inflammatory condition, uh, et cetera. Now, um, at, here at KP Santa Rosa, 
um, Shannon and and Dr. Heis wrote, and I, we all did a study with one of our other colleagues, Dr. Juliette Baltanato, called the Inhale Study, where we tried to look at the 2018. You're not seeing the slides again. Goodness. I can see research inhale study. Oh, okay. Oops, someone said they couldn't, so I got scared. All right, let's see. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, we looked at the association between not a fire being right there, but the smoke. So if anyone remembers the 2018, if you're in this area um, and if you want to put in the chat also where you are and where you're located so we can get a sense of who all is here, that would be helpful too. Um, but in 2018, we had the campfire that was far away from us in Santa Rosa, although we did take care of many patients from there, but it blanketed the entire Bay Area in smoke for weeks. And what we wanted to know, I mean, it was it was kind of an uh, unprecedented, we've been using that word a lot lately, but unprecedented number of consecutive days of high smoke exposure. And what we wanted to know was how much did that exacerbate, um, cause increased hospitalizations and ER visits for uh, smoke related or respiratory related illnesses like asthma and that all of that. Our very uh -oh. interesting finding was that the greatest increase in the number of ER visits and hospitalizations was not among older, sicker folks who already had lung conditions. That's what we would expect, that people who were already had asthma, COPD, who were older, who were more vulnerable, may have the worst uh, outcomes from this. What we actually found was that the greatest increase came from the younger, healthier people. Why? Well, we're not, we can't know, we didn't interview them all. But what we think happened is that most younger, healthier people didn't realize that they too were susceptible to the effects of prolonged wildfire smoke exposure in, in that setting. And so they may not have been taking the same number of precautions. So that is something that we'll reiterate again and again in this presentation is how important it is that everyone be aware that wildfire smoke can affect you too. And the risks can increase not just lung disease and heart disease, um, but also this risk increased risk of diabetes, which again, we don't usually think of as a lung condition. Eugenia made a really great point that catastrophic wildfires are burning hotter than ever before, and that the fire is consuming plastics, paint, chemicals, metals, and other particles that our bodies just don't know what to do with. And you're absolutely correct. That's what we're talking about when we talk about these particulate matter. So again, uh, here's here's we, this is just another visual. Just the wildfire smoke triggers these smoke waves, which are any more anytime there's more than two consecutive days of unhealthy AQI, it's called a smoke wave. And we're seeing longer and longer smoke waves in these areas. And then that poor AQI leads to unhealthy levels of smoke inhalation, which then can flare not only um, respiratory conditions, but as we talked about, all these other symptoms. What we're hoping is how can we how can we educate as many people as possible who are on the ground in the communities educating all of us to try to intervene at the point at that point and make a difference to prevent um un, you know untoward health outcomes so we've now mentioned aqi a lot um presumably most if not all of you know what aqi is it's the air quality index and um, you know, what I think uh, is interesting and I think is really important for all of us in these wildfire uh, zones to recognize is that AQI is a point in time. It's a picture, but what we're living in is a movie. So when the AQI, they say, oh, zero to 50 is good and 51 to 100 is just moderate and most people who are healthy are just fine and can do whatever they want and be outside. Well, what if it's 100 for for 10 days? What if it's 150 days out of the year? That may change the effects. And what's not what I what is not captured in these AQI charts is what about the AQI as a cumulative effect? So as I just talked about 2018, we had 14 consecutive days of not just 100 AQI, but you can see these colors represent the AQI. So we're talking 100 to 
300 AQI in these major metropolitan areas with millions of people being exposed for 14 consecutive days. So the, the meaning of the AQI chart that says that sure it's okay if you don't have lung disease, that's for, 20, that's for a 24 hour period. It's not for a 14 day period. And we don't have, we don't yet have uh, charts that describe what we're supposed to do when there's 14 consecutive days or 30 days out of the year or 50 days out of the year. So we're going to try again. We're going to Who pause should again. protect themselves? Go yeah. Shannon, go for it. That's all right, no problem. So we're just going to pause for a moment um, and I want you to just turn and think about this. So who should protect themselves from wildfire smoke? Is it A, older people, B, sensitive groups, C, everyone, or D, people with lung problems? So again, the uh, the responses are, are up here, right? I know, oh, I know, we, we, have, we have a ringer in the audience, I love it. Um, so you can text uh, your response or you can, um, right, everyone is, everyone's been paying attention. Great work, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I've made these questions very easy for you all. That's great. And it's okay. always Thank C. You. We got to move everyone to like D or B. B is the new C. <laughs> great. So again, everyone. So we're talking about and especially thinking about people like people who are pregnant, people who are older people who are working outside and don't have the ability to choose to be inside. Um, younger, healthier people who plan to live for a really long time in this area. Um, so that picture in the upper right are our residents, our resident physicians. They are, they are the primary care physicians uh, of the future. They will be our workforce for the next 40 to 60 years. And we want them to be healthy. So even though they may feel invincible now because they're in their 20s, and 30s, um, you know, this smoke may affect them too. And certainly children who have much higher metabolisms, which means that um, they breathe faster and babies even faster, which means that they are circulating those PM 2.5 particles even faster than adults that breathe more slowly. And I love that Melissa Kaplan put better than the EPA AQI is the Purple Air app. We love the Purple Air app. It's a great um, way to get an idea as to where your local area is. One of the questions that was uh, asked earlier is how does a fire, let's say in Australia, affect us? That particulate concentration gets it comes over to other countries. We are one earth and it gets caught up into our different um, gosh, uh, climates that occur throughout our, our world. And a lot of that particular concentration actually drops down uh, and affects other areas. So it's really important to um, have a good idea as to what the AQI is in your area, because that's, we know for us so in Sonoma County, we can um, gauge how busy our day is gonna be in the office based on the AQI and how many days straight it's been a compromised AQI. Exactly. And the Air Now uh, app, which I think is what feeds things like the, if you have an iPhone or smartphone that has a weather widget, um, that is that AQI is now on those widgets. That wasn't true, you know, five years ago. However, a lot of, the, so, you know, Air Now has very accurate sensors, but they are not they are not um, precise. So they are accurate, meaning they're very accurate. Uh, no, they're precise, but not accurate. It doesn't matter. The point is they only have a few around the area. So they are they are very, um, they're true for where that sensor is, but you're not at the sensor. So what I like about the Purple Air app also is that it is kind of real time um, on the ground, sort of uh, a uh, community based scientific effort of outdoor and also indoor air quality. And I think that um, what I like about Purple Air is that you can purchase indoor, and there's other non-Purple Air branded, indoor AQI monitors, which I think can be really helpful for learning how we can improve the air quality indoors. And for things like, for example, using gas stoves, creates PM 2.5 particles. And so as we think about how do we 
improve our air pollution overall, both outside and inside over the next decades and beyond, um, thinking about transitioning to other forms of energy and other form, you know, ways, you know, electric vehicles and other um, types of energy utilization that don't produce even more AQI, uh, I mean, particulate matter. So the next question is, we're now moving to what do we do about it? We've kind of now told you or reiterated what you already know about the potential dangers. So um, Shannon, actually, do you think it's going to work on mine? Oh, no, I think it's just the chat. Okay, if people want to put it in the chat. So, yeah, so stay and indoors. While are, oh, yeah, go ahead. Doing that, there was a question from Al. Is this effect worse for runners due to exertion? 100%. Uh, yes. Well, not runners just by the fact that they're runners, but yes, run. So, heavy exertion outside, anything that makes you breathe more, more air, more fast, heavier, is going to, you're going to inhale more PM2.5. Trish, why don't you go ahead? Yep, absolutely. So I'm looking at the chat and everyone, absolutely. So uh, all of the above, right? So using kind of a multifactorial approach, um, you really want to make sure that you're just trying to decrease that particulate concentration. There was a great question in the chat. Um, are, does nature handle the particulate concentration? And the answer is yes and no, right? A lot of the particulate concentration is taken care of by nature and through the filters that we talk about. Um, but there is quite a bit that gets caught in the atmosphere and it adds to increasing temperatures, global warming and other climate issues. Exactly. And I guess the other thing is, remember, like nature, nature doesn't mean good. <laughs> um, right. And part of part of what part of what probably, you know, killed off all the dinosaurs was meteors and and things that created too much particulate matter in the air, blocked out the sun, and then lots of life died. So um, there are there are PM 2.5 particles that can also then get into the soil and acidify water, um, and also have other effects in, uh, in on our wildlife and water systems. Then we're not going to talk about the, to that today. The main thing is what do we do when when AQI is high? And for I, I would say my feeling, having now lived through many fire seasons, is I consider high AQI anything over a hundred. Um, I know that you know over a hundred is when even sensitive group when sensitive groups are supposed to really start um, start paying attention. I think that any of us who have lived through more than one fire season are would now be considered a sensitive group because we have probably have some accumulation of PM 2.5 particles in our bloodstream and, and we've been exposed to some amount and that cumulative effect, you want to try to minimize the effects over time. So I personally, for myself, for my children, I consider anything over 100 something that we need to, I'm not going to like evacuate, but that, that I need to pay attention to. I need to think about changing my behavior and my family's behavior when the AQI gets over 100. So what should you do when AQI is high? You kind of have two options. Um, when it's super, super, super high, like in the over 300 range, if you are at the, you know, at the site of very close to a fire, if you can, or even if not, if you're, you know, if you're in the, if you have the privilege and the resources and you're in an area where there's over 300 AQI um, and you're at high risk, um, you find cleaner air. Um, though, as I think someone just posted in the chat, many cars driving with gas engines also worsens temporarily the AQI. But if we're talking about weeks of very, very bad AQI, uh, cars driving, you know, over several hours is not going to significantly make a difference. But the the most important thing that we need to think about, and this is where I think, again, we, we think about in disaster settings, who needs to leave their home and evacuate because their their structure, their house, their home, their life is in danger? We take we have done great job taking care of that sector of people. But what about all the people that are just outside the evacuation zone and their AQI? They're living in a really bad AQI, but they're not not in direct threat. What about again the people that are living in places where they're far from the fire, but they're that's where the smoke comes. So if you if it's not time or you're unable to find cleaner air by going to a place, then you want to make cleaner air. And that includes making cleaner air 
right near your face and making cleaner air in the in the environments in which you're you are. So um, HEPA filters. So we've talked about that. And what does HEPA filter mean? It's high efficiency particulate air filters. So these are uh, lots of randomly assorted fibers that trap all these particulates, including the very smallest, including COVID, including other viruses and bacteria, bacteria are much larger than viruses, but viruses are often very small as well, and uh, dust and pollen and all of these things. And so they can remove 99, a good HEPA filter can remove 99.97% of particles that are sized 0.3 microns. So we talked about 2.5, PM 2.5, 2.5 microns. And so this is 0.3 microns. So that's like size of vi viruses. It does not remove gases and vapors. And um, if there are studies that have shown that, you know, those people who are using HEPA filters should, had decreased reporting of respiratory symptoms um, during wildfires. And um, same thing again, there, again, something to remember is that if you, even if you are um, not having the effects of wildfire smoke, if you're living in a poorly ventilated home and you have a wood burning stove or you have a gas stove or you just have kind of poor ventilation in general, you may still have a fairly high AQI or PM 2.5 particulate matter concentrate in your air, even, even without wildfire. So, um, so HEPA filters can be helpful for those things too. So Chuck Spalding had a great question. In the news coverage, firefighters are not shown wearing masks. Why? Um, I believe that is a cultural issue. I think the wearing of masks has evolved tremendously since COVID has come into our <laughs> world. In the medical community, we often never wore masks, even in the emergency room or during the winter flu seasons. And I think it is a culture issue being tough. Um, and I do think it's evolving. And then uh, Alex flatly asks, is there a chart that shows how often to replace different types of masks based on various AQIs? Well, let's get to masks We're and then we can definitely address minute. that. Wood burning fireplaces, again, anything that idea. burns wood will, will emit Increase particulate protein. matter. Now, is it uh, you know, if you're having a, a wood, you know, if you're having a, a little, um, you know, fire in your house and you want to have a fireplace and have a nice evening, um, should you stop doing all, like using your fireplace entirely? I mean, people still go camping and have campfires. Those are all smoke exposures and they're, you know, small smoke exposures. And something to think about though, is that it is cumulative effect. So again, not, not suggesting that anyone stop having fireplaces or going to campfires. However, um, you know, maybe not when you've just had a smoke event and your lungs are already vulnerable. Um, candles, incense, all of those things emit smoke and particulate matter. And if you, if you get a home AQI monitor for the indoor air in your home, um, you can, you can measure it. So, uh, some homes have central air filters, and these are called MERV. I don't know what MERV stands for, but um, but they're a fiberglass filter that has a rating based on how uh, how high efficiency the, the the filtration is. And most of the home home fil center central filters are using a rating of one to four. And so um, one suggestion for your home is that if you do have this type of filter in your home, to upgrade to a MERV 5 to 8, which will significantly improve the air quality in your home. And you would want to probably, I'm guessing, replace that every season, every wild, you know, after any wildfire season um, or uh, whatever the manufacturer recommendations are. There you go. And then we have a question. I'm checking to see who it is. I have to scroll through. There's a lot of people on the call, so I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> Um, All right. So I want to make a mention of as we're talking about filters that HEPA, you know, expensive HEPA filters are very effective and MERV filters, if you have central air, are very effective. But there is a um, new uh, DIY do-it-yourself box fan filter that has been um, now both studied 
and um, used called the Corsi Rosenthal box after um, Corsi and Rosenthal, who are two researchers, I think at UC Davis. And what they found is that taking a, you know, $20 box fan that you can get at any local store and attaching a MERV 13, one of the highest rating filters, you can either just attach it to the back, right, and, and call it a day, or creating a little box, either with two of them, little triangle as pictured here, or actually creating a four, um, you know, four sided box uh, can work as well as a large room, like a large room, several hundred dollar HEPA filter. And so for less than $75, you can create your own HEPA filter. It's an idea that we have for thinking about, um, you know, doing community projects. It's something that could be done to give to people who are at high risk, who are not able to evacuate, who may be in the highest risk zones, or to suggest. Why don't we take a few questions? So Carmen and Carol both have questions. Hi, this is Carmen. I, I was wondering, uh, the particles that do enter your bloodstream, are they there forever and just accumulate, accumulate, or can they be removed from your bloodstream some way? Or I that's great. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that we know the exact answer. They're not heavy metals. And so I don't think that they necessarily accumulate in your body fat or, you know, like some other types of particles like microplastics. I do think that's one reason why increasing your water intake and potentially taking vitamin C or other antioxidants when you're in a state, you know, when you're um, experiencing wildfire smoke can help uh, boost the systems that you have, your liver, your kidneys, the filtration systems that we naturally have in our body that can help filter out some of these particles from our bloodstream. But I'll Thank admit, you. I don't know the exact answer to that. And I can tell you that there, this is a huge area of research right now. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then another question would these, um, I think you're talking about, uh, these Corsi Rosenthal boxes, would these be realistic for, for shelters? And again, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, the, the challenge is that they are loud because it's a box fan. It's not like a super slick HEPA filter that has a nice low hum. It's a box fan. And I, I made one for my house um, with just the box fan and just one filter. Um, you want to just make sure that basically you want the, the fan blowing air out and then the air is getting sucked in through the filter and there's YouTube instructions and everything. This is open source, but um, the, de the, the downside is that they're allowed, but the upside is that even though they're, they can also be good for COVID um, because they don't, the MERV filters don't filter viral particles quite as well as HEPA, but they filter faster. So once it goes through two or, two or three times, it filters almost as well for both viruses as well as air. And again, I think this is a, a, a not marketed well enough um, uh, option to really help improve community health. So what about masks? We all know about masks because of COVID. And, uh, you know, one thing that's really important to recognize is that the masks that will work best for wildfire smoke, again, they have to be really, really well fitting and really, really good filtration because those particles are really tiny. So particles like wildfire smoke can get right through a cloth mask where they're not droplets. So whereas we can have definitely some protection um, from COVID and other viruses with even a cloth mask can still offer some amount of protection because a lot of the times we're getting hit with droplets um, that splatter, you know, people, people spit and they sneeze. Um, but well fitting what with something like smoke and these tiny, tiny particles, they will go wherever there is room. So if you're wearing even an N95 mask, which is one of the N series is um, is the N95, N99, N100, and then there's the R and the P series. And these are like the respirator masks that you see. They look like kind of the gas masks that sometimes people wear. You can get them at hardware stores. They actually work very well for wildfire smoke and you have replaceable cartridges. So those can be very good for repeated seasons because N95s are disposable. Um, but they have to be very well fitting. And, and here as physicians, we are not authorized to wear N95 masks 
at work that we have not been what we call fit tested for, where we put on a big hood and they they spray this bitter tasting particle that's really small and we wear a mask and if we taste the bitterness, then it, it doesn't work. Facial hair, different sized faces, very small faces, very large faces, kid faces, um, may not work with an N95 mask. And the best N N95 masks, when you're really wearing them and they're really well fitting, it's hard to breathe um, for many, many hours. And so the N95 masks that were marketed for most fire seasons were the ones that we had pre-COVID with the vents. The problem is that those vents then don't block out viral particles. So if you are in a situation where you wanna protect yourself from smoke, but you wanna breathe, but then you also wanna protect yourself from or protect others from potential viruses, what you wanna do is wear an N95 mask with a vent and then wear some kind of, you know, loot like a surgical mask or cloth mask on top of it to help protect the trap, the big, the big particles from, uh, you know, from protecting others. Does that make sense? Because um, the vents will help, are, are able to actually, um, you know, filter and allow you to breathe if you need to be outside. So the biggest thing is that fit testing, facial hair, and children. So the easiest masks to breathe in do have vents. And most N95s, even with a vent, you know, it's it's essentially good for about eight hours. If you're in a high smoke, if you're outside breathing the smoke and it's trapping it, it's trapping those particles. So it will fill up with the particles and then will stop working. The way that you know is that it becomes even more difficult to breathe through it. So when they become really hard to breathe through, they're done and you need to replace them. So, you know, what, one of the things that we want to think about is the idea of the harm reduction model. We know that not everyone has access to HEPA filters. We know that not everyone can or should evacuate when there's high AQI. We know that not everyone is going to be able to wear the best possible masks all the time. Many people work outside and are not going to be able to stay inside, but masks definitely have a role when people have to be exposed to wildfire smoke. And so what your goal is, is just to use the best available mask with the best possible fit um, and be outside or in that high AQI for the shortest possible time. And I think that my approach to wildfire smoke is my same approach as to parenting, which is you do what you can. And we can't, we can't make perfect the enemy of good. We try our best and we try to continue to learn and to figure out ways to, um, to improve. So one of the reasons that we're excited to share this presentation with you is because all of you are, are community members, community leaders. You're making a difference. You're interacting with lots of people. And what we know is that simple, straightforward messages from trusted, you know, public service individuals, whether it's doctors or the Red Cross or the health department or the city, do make a difference. And the studies that looked at PSAs, public service advisories, found that the number of public service advisories that people recalled was protective in a dose response manner, meaning if you recalled, have if, if you remembered that there were three advisories in the past month, you you actually were more protected from wildfire smoke. So meaning that it made a difference. The people that remembered more seemed to have more protection. Um, and so they had decreased respiratory symptoms if they remembered hearing a public service advisory. So the more messaging we can all share with our community members, repeated simple messages make a difference. So things like, well, we did talk about wear a mask, have a filtration, but just staying inside and reducing outdoor physical activity, that question was brought up earlier, is really important. Again, because if you're outside and you're doing a light stroll, you're breathing, you know, how many times per minute? 16, 18, 20 times per minute. When you're running, you're not only breathing faster, but you're breathing harder and heavy, heavier. You're inhaling more air, more forcefully. You're inhaling more of those two, PM 2.5 particles. So reducing you know, a, a smoke event or a smoke wave is not the time to start your outdoor running program. It's not the time to let your kids play outside. It's some, you know, something that we didn't really talk about is for parents um, thinking about schools and school attendance and talking to your kids' schools about their plans for 
for what to do in the event of smoke and are the classrooms, do they have enough filtration both for COVID now as well as smoke? We used to say with smoke to stay inside, but then with COVID we said outside. It's all very confusing, but we do the best that we can. We try to um, keep uh, as much protection as possible. That concludes our presentation, Rachel, which means that we have questions. time for questions. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, that came up. Does making a cloth mask damp improve its effectiveness? So first, I don't think so. I yeah. mean, so, so I, I think that, so there's, so with smoke, it's possible that it might, right? Breathing through like wet, I think that it helps to mitigate some of the larger particles. It traps some of the larger particles for smoke. Damp cloth masks definitely don't, um, protect against COVID, which is not what we're talking about, but um, but that's a good question and I don't know the answer. In terms of do you wear the mask inside, um, again, when, when we had our tubs fire in 2017 and the fire came within, like, I mean, it was visible, it came within 10 feet of our medical center, our hospital had to evacuate in two and a half hours, the flames were right there, and so there was a lot of smoke and inside the buildings when we got back to work, when we were finally able to return to work. And we didn't know about COVID. And so the filtration and the ventilation was terrible. I actually had to wear a respirator mask. I have a picture of myself wearing one of those gas masks because being at work, um, you know, for that long, it was the most comfortable to wear for the whole day. I, was, I wasn't trained for COVID. Now I can wear uh, N95 for 12 hours, no problem. But, you know, I, I do recommend if, if your house or your indoor spaces are not well filtrated, then yes, wearing a mask, even, you know, an, an N95 mask will help. Any type of high filtration mask will help. What other questions do people have? How long does particulate matter remain a problem after a fire is over? Is it on the ground? Can it be stirred up? So is it on the ground? Yes. Can it be stirred up? Yes. Because we actually had a worsening AQI after the tubs fire, after the fire was finally out, when they started, you know, like tearing down all the structures that had been damaged in the fire and starting the construction of the new structures, we actually had a worsening AQI. Um, how long it stays in the environment really depends on so many different factors, winds, rain, and other things. Um, and that is why having kind of your go-to app that you use for up-to-date AQI information can be really helpful. Yeah, and another thing um, is in terms of indoor spaces. So if the, there's, you know, a smoke event and you're trying to, you know, keep your indoor spaces clean, vacuuming and sweeping and, you know, that stirs up, don't burn candles, exactly. right? You want to try to clean the air as much as possible. Try not to use, if you have a microwave, you use a microwave instead of a gas stove or oven because all would you no know, don't have the fireplace running so you want to try to reduce anything that could increase the aqi in your house and if there are days when it's better air out the house and let those particles go outside um, and then kind of you know close back up when if things get worse but um but that is a recommendation what other so i mean i guess we hopefully now for our post test hopefully you now know the answers to all of these questions um, but I really want to focus now in our last few minutes and hear maybe from you all who have experience with the Red Cross in shelters with your communities and think about what what other ideas um, do you have? How can you keep our how we can keep our communities safe and healthy and protected from wildfire smoke? We have a couple of hands raised. Uh, Carmen, if you want to go ahead and, and speak, let us know I what you're thinking. It. Quick question. Um, I live in Imperial County, and a lot of our air quality, bad air quality, comes from uh, agricultural burning, and then a lot of it comes from Mexicali, I guess, to the border across the border. Now, is that smoke as bad as, say, the wildfires smoke? That's, I guess, maybe a lot hotter. Or so. Yeah, I mean, so again, the controlled burning of uh, of wood and other plant matter it still releases some the PM 2.5 and the PM 10. Like 
all air pollution is still air pollution. So, what, I mean, pollen is essentially still air pollution of a sort, right? Yeah. And so it can still cause some of those symptoms. But but it, if it's controlled burn of just plant matter, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily as toxic because it doesn't necessarily contain the plastics and the, and the diesels and the, you know, when a car burns up, when a whole <laughs> home burns up, it contains a lot more chemicals and paint and all those things that are much more toxic. So it can, it, if the AQI, again, if your local AQI is high, you still want to protect yourself. It's, it may not be as toxic um, in the short and long term. Okay, thank you. And William has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. So uh, two years ago during the CZU fire and the Creek fire, um, some of our shelter residents, their, their uh, properties uh, were not affected, but the, the air in the communities were. And so some of the barriers to get them back, to get them back home and uh, so they can leave the shelter, was the was the indoor uh, was the air quality index? Um, so my question is twofold. One, what agencies should we really be working with to see if the air quality is at a sufficient level in those communities to rehouse them? And number two, is there any mitigation strategies that we could equip them with so when they get home they're not, you know, they're not re affected by the fire? That's a great question. In terms of agencies, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Again, I think that making sure they that you have the apps or the um, the ability to look at. I, I'm I don't know who's in charge of. But I'm just a doctor. <laughs> We're just doctors. I don't know. We're not in charge of rehousing or making, you know, public health, public orders. But I think that looking at, I would say, again, depending on the person, um, but if the AQI is above, say, like 250, it's going to be hard. Um, I remember in the 2020 um, fire, the glass fire, it came fairly close to my house. And um, and we evacuated because the AQI started rising up to near 300 because the fire was so close. And I was I couldn't we couldn't when we were evacuated in Petaluma. I looked at our home AQI monitor, and even with all the doors and everything shut, it never got below 150. Um, and so you know I think that um, number one is having the you know being able to see what the local the hyper local AQI is not just the broad air now AQI and then the second thing is um, equipping with those um, instructions when the AQI goes down when you get home air out your house that it, wear an N95 mask and and air out your house change filters um you know open windows try and get any visible ash and and away from the house but use protection eye protection and mask protection as you're cleaning and then if you can if you can have HEPA filters if not maybe give instructions for the Corsi Rosenthal boxes. And, and my hope would be as how can we think about as community members um, or organizations to, to get or produce or modify to create as many of these uh, modified cheaper air filters as possible. Every home in California probably needs air filtration. How do we make sure that every community gets it? I don't know the answer, but, um, but I think we should be asking that question. One more follow up, and, and, and it might be another one of those questions that's unanswerable. Um, during the debris removal uh, and um, the, the reconstruction process, in other words, rebuilding the homes in the area, it, it stirs up that material on the ground, and you, we talked about that earlier. Um, so, is would we go back to that Purple Air app, or is there something else that we should be monitoring to, to see if those uh, particular matters are rising in those in those areas? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, we do the best that we can. We can't always monitor every single thing. And so having, I think that more sensors are better because it gives us more data. And um, while we know as physicians that, you know, or just ordering a bunch of tests isn't always helpful because then we need to know how to interpret it and what to do with the results of those tests. In general, you know, data is useful. And so having more data is better and then we can make the best possible um, decisions based on that. Thank I think we have time you. for a few more questions, maybe. Eleanor and Ken have their hands up. So if we could go to Eleanor first and then we'll follow up with Ken. Thank you. This is an, an advice 
you can be my dear doctor advice column. I'm running an uh, uh, actually running a family vacation for about 70 people going up to Yosemite in a week. And there's children, there's pregnant girls, there's old people, there's the whole nine yards of family members. And I'm there asking me every single day, should we go, should we go? And I'm listening to this going, well, probably not. Maybe not if you're pregnant, maybe not if you're, you've got children under five. Maybe, uh, if, am I understanding this correctly? Is 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 stay away from that from that place as long as possible? Yeah, these are the questions that we get all the time, and I think that there are not always easy answers because there's also you know you have there's the balance of um, uh, protection and the best possible sort of mitigation strategies, and then there's also uh, you know, is this a once in 25 year family reunion and you're never going to get these people together again? And right. And so it's 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 a it's a it's a toss up. I think that things that you need to ask yourself are, yeah, who's coming and what what is the air quality in that local area? Where are you going to be? And is the indoor air quality able to be improved enough? Um, but if the if that local AQI is above 200 and their fire is still burning, you know, I think if a, when AQI is less than 200, you can probably just and people are fairly healthy. You can be outside for short periods of time with masks on and, uh, you know, just mostly kind of stay inside. But um, I, you know, my family and I went to a family camp near Yosemite last year. And on the way, we realized that the the fire from Tahoe was the AQI was terrible. So we stopped at a Costco on the way and bought a bought an air filter, but we were staying, it was a family camp. So we were staying in cabins. And even with the air filter after two nights, we just didn't, like everything was outside and we just didn't feel safe. So we ended up leaving early. And so, you know, I think you kind of have to make those decisions. There's not a right answer, but think about all the different factors and who's going to be affected and do the best that you can. What I also understood you to say was that being over 200 for one day or two is one thing, but if you're up there for 10 days and it's be between uh, 50 and 105, it still is going to be a problem. 50 and 100 and no, no, I think again, an AQI less than 100 um, is is probably fine. We're, um, we're talking about AQI of 100, you don't want right. to be we're talking about years, you know, and that at an AQI of 100, most people can be outside and they might not feel great, but like they can be outside. It's not going to be immediately dangerous. Um, an AQI over 200 is not good for anyone and you should not be outside for any length of time, like any long length of time at that level. But an AQI of 50 to 100 is totally fine for 10 days. Um, and the people that are most vulnerable would want to, you know, bring masks or try to stay indoors most of the time or have filtration. So when they're sleeping, they can cleanse the air. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. This is not medical advice. <laughs> Disclaimers. Yeah. No, no. I'm looking for ways to talk to my family about this. So this is very, yeah. very kind of you to give me that time. Ken, what's your question, sir? Yeah, actually, I don't have a question. I, I'm Ken Tour, and I'm the CEO of uh, Red Cross chapter in, of Silicon Valley. And I just want to say this has been incredibly helpful. There's so much great information and tips and ideas that I'm quite sure uh, the volunteers that are on this call and, and I will bring back and uh, discuss with the folks that do all the responses. I, I, you know, I've been in a lot of the, the deployments that you mentioned, and uh, I, I never really thought about all this, but I think it's it's really, really very powerful information. I really want to thank you. And also just want to say that Kaiser has been just an incredible organization, an incredible partner of Red Cross in so many profound ways. Uh, information like this, uh, support during disasters, uh, blood drives that you sponsor and, and hold at your facilities throughout the area, uh, and also from a philanthropic perspective. So I just want to, I just want to really thank you so much and really appreciate everything you do and taking the time to give us some valuable information tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, again, and you stole my thunder, but thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you can add good. on that to that. That was fantastic. Can, I so appreciate it. You can it. add on to it.
let's, let's <laughs> add on to it. I, I appreciate it very much. Adrian did raise her hand. Do we have time for one more? I just have a real quick question. Uh, for those of us that work for government operations with Red Cross, and we need to go out to the incident command post, which is usually the beginning of, say, a fire. I want to know if there's something even more effective than an N95 mask and what you would recommend. So the respirator masks, right? Um, yes. Again, they 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 look a little scary. Um, you can uh, you know look them up, but they what they are. If you're going to be if you're going to be outside and you have to be outside for a really long time, the N95s again are disposable masks. They're not meant to be reused, but the respirator masks don't need to be fitted to your face. Um, so they're like the rubber you know, triangle. And so those are uh, suction enough that they they should fit most faces, although facial hair may still Im impede it. And they've got the cartridges that you can reuse. And that's what I would recommend. Um, and usually it's the half respirator mask as opposed to, you know, like the full, the full is like the full gas mask type thing that covers your eyes too, which is helpful. So some kind of goggles, I would also recommend. I think I have hair back from, back from when we were using these goggles, right? So some kind of goggles for your eyes and um, and the respirator masks are probably your best bet. You can get them at hardware stores or online. Thank you. All right, uh, well. Thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate your attention and this has been a lot of fun and we look forward to collaborating with the Red Cross moving forward. Yeah, I want to reiterate that again. I think that we just want to thank all of you for all of the service that you've provided to our community members. And one of our hopes in doing this presentation and potentially more is we want to support you in being healthy um, because you are also like we are on the front lines and we have to we have to, you know, engage in self care too before we can before we can share that care with others. So wishing you all a safe a safe and healthy fire season. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone who participated and doctors, thank you very much for your time and your expertise and all your knowledge. We are going to take it out to the field and share it and we appreciate it very much. Thanks so much, Sherry. Wonderful. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. It was excellent. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.